He doesn't do anything for my child. That's I have true, to Your take Honor. care of my child that by myself. True, Your Honor. Excuse me, I'm that talking. Is not true, Your Honor. I am talking. You do not that interrupt not true, me when Honor. I'm talking. Okay, Shut let's, your mouth. Let's right settle now. down. Oh, there is a picture in my bed with someone else. A picture of Mr. Adel in the bed with somebody else? Your bed? That's why you cheated, because you saw that picture, so then you went out and did it. Absolutely. You're really the reason your son is dead. I'm not the reason he's listen, dead. Listen, listen, lady. You're the reason. If he you know it. that. Come on. Girl, do let it. me tell do you it. something. If he Best wasn't ladies. with some trashy self, somebody get the order. The case of Taylor and Johnson versus Barber kicks off with a scenario that sounds more like a plot twist from a daytime soap opera than a courtroom drama. The plaintiffs, Miss Taylor and Miss Johnson, claim they both magically got pregnant at the same time by the defendant, Mr. Barber, who seems to have been busier than a bee in spring. They argue that Mr. Barber has been more of a Houdini than a father, disappearing when it comes to supporting their children financially. Miss Taylor and Miss Johnson, you both claim that you were pregnant at the same time with yes. the defendant, Mr. Barber's children. Yes, sir. Yes. You argue that he has not been a father to your kids and refuses to support them, but takes now, the drama unfolds in a way you'd least expect. Miss Taylor and Miss Johnson are suing Mr. Barber for childcare expenses, totaling three six ord and three thousand eight hundred and eighty dollars, respectively. Which sounds like they're trying to finance a small pirate expedition rather than raise children. Mr. Barber counters by claiming he's on the verge of selling an organ or two, unable to support the children due to the plaintiff's demands, which are as excessive as a dragon's appetite for gold. Accompanied by drama levels that could win them an Oscar. Just when you think you've seen it all, the courtroom becomes the stage for even more astonishing revelations. Ms. Taylor, you are suing Mr. Barber for $3,608. You are also asking the court to award you $3,880 in child care expenses. Yes, Your Honor. In a scene straight out of a primitum drama, the plaintiffs accuse Mr. Barber of playing favorites, only supporting his other child because he's still in cahoots with that child's mother. This accusation sparks a heated argument, reminiscent of a reality TV show showdown, with the judge stepping in like a referee in a wrestling match to maintain order. But keep your eyes peeled. The twists and turns are just getting started. I believe that he supports his other child because he's still sleeping with his other child's mother. I have true, to Your take Honor. care of my child that by is not myself. True, Your Honor. Excuse me, I'm that talking. Is not true, Your Honor. I am talking. You do not that interrupt not true, me when I'm talking. Okay, Shut your mouth. I've been having to take care of my child on my own for the last five years. Years. As if scripted by a master storyteller, the court session takes a turn for the sitcom when Mr. Barber receives a phone call, leading to an eruption of laughter and applause from the audience. The judge, channeling his inner comedian, suggests checking if the caller is another woman, adding a plot twist that not even Mr. Barber saw coming. You won't believe what happens next in this roller coaster of emotions and laughter. Uh, Mr. Go. Barber, is somebody <laughs> calling you? <laughs> Jerome, answer it and see if it's a woman. They probably never call back again if they find out she's in fraternity oh, court. God, in a breathtaking moment, Mr. Barber drops a bombshell, admitting he's the father of all the children involved and has even autographed their birth certificates like their memorabilia. The discussion about his presence during the births and his emotional Oscars-worthy performance when confronted about his absence at one of the deliveries adds more layers to his already complex character study. The next scene is even more gripping as the judge brings a new perspective to the table. So if I saw the birth certificates, I have signed every single Ms. Johnson? Yeah, he's on mine. He's on mine. Ms. Taylor? Taylor? Mm -hmm. Cut the umbilical cord and everything. What? Yeah, did he cut the umbilical cord for you? Oh, how about you, Cash? Oh, you done started oh, okay. something okay. now. With wisdom that cuts through the chaos, Judge Lake takes the stage, emphasizing the importance of communication, responsibility, and the need for a sitcom-style resolution that prioritizes the well-being of the children over the adult drama, which has enough material to start its own spin-off series. The saga continues with more unexpected turns that will leave you on the edge of your seat. I also see how frustrated Mr. Barber is. I see a man who's admitting pretty much I blew it. But when you two go to speak, I took a moment to just observe you. I mean, you go to not level 10, level 20 in a matter of two seconds, and you all make me uncomfortable watching you yell and scream. In a revealing spotlight, the focus turns to Mr. Barber's financial contributions, or the lack thereof, which makes the two packs of diapers he bought seem like a desperate attempt at a peace offering. Miss Taylor and Miss Johnson share their tales of minimal support, which could easily be the plot for a tragic comedy skit. But just when you think you've heard it all, the story deepens with even more intrigue. Have you sent Miss Taylor or Miss Johnson any money Recently? consistently? Consistently, no, ma'am. Miss Taylor, he bought my daughter two packs of diapers. 
And how old is your daughter? My daughter is that. five years old. And Ms. Johnson, you saying you never got, you never bought my son on diaper. I may do whatever I had to do to get my son. The courtroom is thrust into the realm of a telenovela when it's revealed Mr. Barber had three women pregnant at the same time, turning the courtroom into a scene straight out of a telenovela, complete with gasps from the audience and dramatic background music. The drama escalates to new heights, setting the stage for a verdict that will leave everyone talking. You know, it is this court's opinion that Ms. Taylor is in fact entitled to $3,608 in back child care expenses. <laughs> Moving on. Did you also bring receipts? Yes, I bring receipts. And information for the court regarding your claim? Yes. Is it for the uniform? School uniform. For school, diapers. These expenses are all reasonable and legitimate. Seeing as though you have acknowledged this child, signed his birth certificate, you have a responsibility. The case of Adel versus Jones kicks off with the court clerk spicing up the courtroom, introducing a story juicier than a primetime soap opera. Mr. Adel, feeling more betrayed than when he finds out his favorite show was canceled, alleges Ms. Jones pulled a fast one on him by getting him to sign the birth certificate of her daughter, Jasala, amidst a backdrop of infidelity. Mr. Adel, you are here today to prove Ms. Jones committed paternity fraud. You claim Ms. Jones duped you into signing her daughter's birth certificate only to find out after her child was born that she cheated prior to getting pregnant. You say she broke the terms of your relationship. Is that correct? Mr. Adel, diving into the nitty gritty, reveals their swinging lifestyle, accusing Ms. Jones of stepping out of bounds by having a rendezvous without him as her wingman. He's convinced Ms. Jones is trying to make him the fall guy for her baby, sparking a debate over the do's and don'ts of their open relationship playbook, which apparently included a strict no solo flights policy and an iron clad commitment to protection. What do you mean she broke the terms of the relationship? We have certain rules. We're swingers, you know, and um, okay. And she went outside of the relationship. She cheated on me, and now she's trying to pin the baby on me. So wait, you have swinger rules? Yes, ma'am. What are the rules? What are the terms? The rules are you don't you don't go outside of the relationship and have have uh, sexual relations with anyone outside of the relationship unless the other one is present. Miss Jones owns up to her mischief, confessing to cheating as a comeback for Mr. Adel's suspected escapades. She maintains she armored up during her act of spite, which was set off by stumbling upon a photo of Mr. Adel that screamed guilty. This tit-for-tat move had her channeling her inner soap opera villain, seeking revenge with the finesse of a scorned telenovela star. He cheated too, though. I did out of spite. You did it out of spite. You yeah. feel like he cheated. Your Honor, she's, she swears to God I cheated, and I, 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 don't, I don't cheat. Oh, there is a picture in my bed with someone else. A picture of Mr. Adel in the bed with somebody else? Your bed? Yes, Your Honor. And that's why you cheated, because you saw that picture, so then you went out and did it. Absolutely. Now we know two wrongs never make a right. It just makes drama. The tale takes us back to how this dynamic duo first crossed paths and took a dive into the swingers' pool, with Mr. Adel playing the role of the seasoned guide. Despite Ms. Jones' initial reservations, akin to dipping her toes into ice-cold water, she plunged into the lifestyle, aiming to score brownie points with Mr. Adel, which led to their memorable, albeit awkward, first threesome. At first, I thought he was crazy. Why would you want to sleep with somebody else other than your loved one? Because That's it's what I'm thinking. It's exciting. But I gave it a chance because I loved him. So the first time you all have this threesome, what happened? I mean, I know what happens, I guess, but... <laughs> I, well, I really don't, but I, I don't know if I want to know. The plot thickens with the mystery of Jasala's paternity taking center stage amidst the backdrop of their unconventional relationship dynamics. Ms. Jones admits to a steamy encounter with another player during one of their swinging soirees, but stands her ground on the protection protocol, throwing a curveball into the paternity puzzle. What happened with this other man? Why decide to have sex with this other man? I felt neglected. He wasn't home. He would leave many hours of the night, sometimes even days. And when I would ask him where he was, he would tell me it's none of my business. Business. So I turned around and went out with one of his friends, had a couple drinks, and one thing led to the next. We used the condom, I remember, and when I told them there may not be a possibility, I was trying to get under his skin. In a twist worthy of a season finale cliffhanger, the courtroom holds its breath as the DNA results are unveiled. The air buzzes with a mix of shock, tears, and a sudden rush of reality, hitting harder than a poorly timed sitcom laugh track as everyone processes this life-altering news. If she is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the man I need to be. I'm gonna be there for her and we're gonna we're gonna start a we're gonna start a life. When you say start a life, do you two wanna have a relationship together? I I, I loved her since the day I met her. 
you know, and I'd, I'd like to move on with her. I'd like to be, I'd like to still be in a relationship with her. And I, I can't bl blame her 100%, but I, I need to know if that's my baby or not. I'm glad you can admit that. I think it's time for the results. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Adel, you are the father. I told you. The episode starts with the kind of drama that could put daytime soap operas to shame, featuring the case of Banks versus Hawkins. Miss Banks is throwing shade faster than a cloudy day in Seattle, claiming Miss Hawkins is pinning her baby on Banks' late son, Daryl, like he's some kind of posthumous paternity pinata. On the flip side, Miss Hawkins is standing her ground, insisting Daryl is the daddy and accusing Miss Banks of trying to erase her son's legacy as if she's got a giant cosmic eraser. Miss Banks, you say the defendant is pinning her baby on your son, Daryl, who was trying tragically murdered before her child was born. You say Daryl told you he didn't believe he was the father, and you intend to prove that today. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Hawkins, you state Ms. Banks is denying her son's legacy, Jasani, and you claim today's DNA results will prove Daryl is the father. Is yes, that correct? Your Honor. Miss Banks dives into her sea of skepticism, not convinced that Dasani, who by the way shares a name with a brand of bottled water, adding an unexpected layer of hydration to the drama, is her grandson. She talks about her bond with Daryl, who apparently had more doubts than a conspiracy theorist at a science convention. She paints a picture of Daryl and Miss Hawkins' roller coaster romance, complete with other women popping up like whack-a-moles, claiming Daryl's the father of their kids too. It's like a Maury Povich show, but with more plot twists. I don't believe that Jashani is my grandson, and I'm here to prove it today. For the simple fact that Jada and my son had a very rocky relationship. We were just were really close. We talked all the time. He would just call me to tell me that he loved me. They kept breaking up. So when my son told me about this, I told him that I was gonna get a DNA. And the type of person my son was, if he really believed that Miss Jada had his baby, he would have said to me, no, mom, no. Miss Hawkins steps up to the plate, swinging for the fences, with her love story with Daryl portraying a romance that could make Romeo and Juliet look like a casual fling. She's laying down the timeline of their relationship with the precision of a Swiss watch, trying to debunk Miss Banks' skepticism as if she's a mythbuster dealing with relationship rumors. This is her chance to prove that her connection with Daryl was more than just a fling. It was a marathon of love, not a sprint. Daryl and I had a strong relationship. We were, we were on and off. I loved him very much. He loved me very much. When I told him I was pregnant, he wanted me to keep it. We were we got back together and we started working on it. And so if you got pregnant during the time you broke up and you were seeing someone else, could this other person potentially be your child's father? No. No, Your Honor, because I was only with someone else for two weeks. I found that I was pregnant. I was about six weeks pregnant. So you feel like you were already pregnant before you and Daryl broke, broke up? up yes. Miss Banks tells the tale of how she found out about Miss Hawkins' bun in the oven, which apparently was more surprising than finding out your quiet neighbor is a karaoke champion. This bombshell led to a who's the daddy debate that could rival any primetime mystery show, turning the whole scenario into a game of Clue, where everyone's guessing who the father is with the enthusiasm of a detective on their third cup of coffee. He came to me, he called me on the phone, and he was like, Mom, Jada's pregnant. And I was like, who is Jada? And he was like, she's my new girlfriend. And I was like, oh, here we go again. My son had a lot of girlfriends. And to me, Jada was just another girl that came along, and now she's saying she's pregnant. Of course, Daryl was gonna be like, he wants to have a baby. He comes from a large family. So how was it that he expressed that he was doubtful? When she called and said that she was pregnant, she was living with another man. Oh. Correction. Oh. I was not living with another man. I was staying with my cousin. I was in a relationship with another man. And when I found that I was pregnant, the other man said, if you decide to keep the baby, let's end the relationship. That's how I ended back up with Daryl. So you came back to my son because another man didn't want you? Because I wanted my baby, and Daryl wanted my baby too. The courtroom heats up faster than a microwave meal, with Miss Banks and Miss Hawkins slinging accusations like they're in a food fight, mm, but with words. The air is so tense you could cut it with a knife or perhaps a gavel. This verbal tug of war pulls at the heartstrings and the laugh lines as the situation's absurdity unfolds like a dramatic origami. You're really the reason your son is dead. I'm not the reason he's listen, dead. Listen, listen, ladies. You're the reason. He, you ladies, know that. You ladies. Know that. Come on. Girl, do baby, it. Tell do you it. Something. If he Miss wasn't ladies, with some trashy self, first of all, let's get some order. Let's get some order. 
ladies. Why would you name him Jay Shani when you know that my son is dead? The whole time you were pregnant, you told us you were gonna let name that baby Daryl Ray Daniel III. You speak. In a twist that's part heartfelt and part head scratching, Miss Banks extends an olive branch or maybe a whole olive tree, inviting Miss Hawkins and the kiddo to move closer. This gesture is more complex than a lasagna, showing Miss Banks' tangled web of hope, skepticism, and a dash of unexpected hospitality. It's like she's saying, I might doubt you, but let's be neighbors. Once he passes, do you try to form a relationship with Miss Hawk? Yes, I try to form a relationship with her because I knew Jada's situation. I have a bunch of kids. I have a house. So I talked to Jada on the phone and I said to her, well, Jada, come on. Move to Houston with us. I can help you better if you live close to me. I bought Jada a one-way ticket. Yes, it was a one-way ticket because you were supposed to be coming. I get to the airport with balloons in my hand, excited because this is all that I have left. I'm standing in the airport like an idiot. This one's nowhere around. And then, the moment of truth. The DNA results come in, shining brighter than a spotlight on a stage. It has been determined by this court. The percentage of relatedness between Miss Lewinda Banks and Jasani Daniel is 99.99%. You are related. <laughs> The case kicks off with Ms. Hayes dropping the bombshell that her sister might be the mother of her husband's child. After a decade of marriage, no less, she's all set for a paternity showdown, warning her sister of an impending soap opera-level drama if the kid turns out to be her husband's. Ms. Hayes, playing defense, is unfazed, ready to bet her last dollar on the paternity test and plotting a sister exit strategy post-reveal. You say that your sister, the defendant, claims to have a child with your husband of 10 years and you have petitioned the court for a paternity test and you are here to warn her that when he finds out her baby is not his today she'll probably never hear from him again now miss hayes you state that your sister is just jealous that you were able to have her husband's baby totally unexpected right miss hayes caught her hubby and sister in a mega awkward moment and it was like oops not this again because her sister's always been a bit too close to her exes the defendant just shrugged it off leading to a wild chat about their crazy family photo album stick around because the next Next bit is even juicier. How did your sister steal your husband? I came home and found him and her in our bed naked. I knew that they were sleeping together, but to put it in my face and be in my bed and me walk in and catch them naked, why would it be any different? She slept with my first husband and my second husband. You and I didn't even know about my second and she husband had me, until me around each of them in the and same you know, predicament. You won't believe this mess. We then hear about how the defendant's life was a roller coaster of oopsies, from addiction to being homeless, and how the plaintiff tried to be the super superhero. They've got this weird love-hate thing going on, with betrayal, sisterly moments, and even the plaintiff helping deliver her niece or nephew. Just wait. It spirals even more out of control up next. I've had custody of this girl since she was 11. You know, the choices that she made between everything else. The latest time that I rescued you, I helped you get clean. Yes, you're on I went to did. Chicago after not hearing from her for seven years. I lost control of my life, myself, my morals, everything. When and I got clean, got you every time you picked up a phone. When I got call. clean, I who just I was you? I had been who an addict and homeless for 15 dad. years. It wasn't your mom. And it I didn't know me. how to be it respectful. I didn't know how to be a woman. I didn't know how to be a lady. And when all this came about, I didn't go to my sister and say, I need sex or I feel lonely. We used to hang out in her room together, watch movies, whatever we would do. Just when you think it's all out in the open, things get even spicier with the defendant confessing to trying to woo her sister's man. Suppose supposedly because her sister told her to. This turns the courtroom into a full-blown circus, sparking a wild debate about respect, self-worth, and the kind of bonkers logic that seems to run in the family. The judge is more like a referee, trying to make sense of the sharing is caring marriage philosophy. You're gonna wanna see what's up next. It's a doozy. Get ready for the big drum roll as the paternity test steals the spotlight, naming Mr. Hill. We, we took a DNA sample. That, that, that is the truth. I for actually the, showed. The you also stated to the court, Ms. Hayes, that in all the years that you were together, with Mr. Hill, he never got you pregnant. No, and the okay, other 25 right. women that he carried on with for long-term relationship. That's I am, what that is. I don't want your baby. I don't okay. want Kayla. I didn't say you wanted to have the baby. I said you wanted to have the baby taken from us. It's proven I, by your action. It has been determined by this court, Mr. Hill, you are her father. <laughs>